I'm here with Kyle of Vitriol to talk about their upcoming new record, Suffer and Become, out January 26th on Century Media Records. Thank you very much for taking the time today to chat with me about the record. Thank you for the opportunity. I don't know if you noticed, but I posted online that this record slapped me into a different dimension. <laughs> Amazing. That is a huge compliment. That's definitely what we're going for. Holy crap, dude. This thing was like thicker than like a 12 ounce or a 20 ounce steak, I should say. I was awesome. like, holy crap. I don't even know how you guys think music, considering how many moving pieces these tracks have. I, yeah. I, I have a hard time digesting it, never mind making it. Yeah. Yeah, that's the it should, it's it's not the most accessible band that's for sure <laughs> no but it's but but the work like the the thought process the way of putting it all together that still makes sense that it's still like it, it's still music it still takes you from point a to point b i, I yeah, find that i i applaud you i honestly i wouldn't even know where to start like i yeah. like it just it seems to be that it's just such a massive you you embark on such a massive you know undertaking with with creating this music creating a record like this that it just feels overwhelming to me so does oh, it feel who when you, when you ever sit down and making it yeah man that's means a lot thank you for saying that um because that's first and foremost the music is so enormously labor intensive uh that uh you know and that's never the goal is necessarily for to to spend years and years making an album or for people to hear it and think wow that took so long but it's nice that to know that it translates because you know not everyone can hear something like that and you know some people are just more confused by the the layers and the density rather than mystified by it so i'm i'm excited when someone's enjoys the all that information yeah it's, but yeah it's, it, 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 it's demanding of, of the listener i feel like and, that, and that's to me is something that's music has to make you feel something otherwise why the hell are you listening to it right like and when i was listening to this record it made me feel a lot of different things and i thought was an album that while continues uh what you guys did on the debut record it sounds also a little it sounds different from the debut record i, I can see the growth and the band and and the musicianship and the way you approach the record. Uh, did you take time to do a lessons learned of that debut album and see, okay, what worked, what didn't work, where we want to go moving forward? Sort of. Yeah. I mean, um, in a way, like I, I always want to treat our career, each album as its own unique <sighs> endeavor so in a way they have nothing to do with each other but in more practical ways of course you're always trying to improve you're always trying to become a better songwriter you're trying to be a better guitar player you're trying to be a better vocalist lyricist whatever um but in general the goals of each album were very different you know the first album was supposed to be just this like relentless waterboarding of pressure you know and then the i knew for the second album I want to take all that energy and kind of crack it wide open and make it more dynamic, you know, make big, deep valleys and tall hills. And rather than it just being this, of course, the new album's still quite dense and aggressive, but uh, it's, it's a little more refined. You could even say there's more restraint on this new album, you know, when we're, but I like to think, I, I just like to frame it as more dynamic. So when it's, fast it's faster when it's slow it's slower when it's sad it's sadder when it's triumphant it's more triumphant you know so i really wanted to highlight and underscore all of these big emotional shifts in the album because the album is really a, you know the suffering become it's really about the duality of it so i'd say going into this album i don't want to say i was trying to improve on it because i really loved the first album I wouldn't change anything about it, but I knew I had to contrast that album in a way that was interesting. And I felt like uh, uh, making something that had more stronger duality, more dynamic was the move. Is it more challenging to work on a debut record? Because that's that's your first step forward. 
or or is it more challenging to work on on a sophomore which comes with the pressure of the expectations of the debut album yeah great question man wow uh Oh, wow. Yeah, they're so di difficult for such different reasons. You know, the first album is difficult in a way that no other album is difficult because you are searching for the sound of the band, typically. I mean, so some bands have put out multiple EPs. Some bands have been together for 10 years before they put out their first full length. But uh, that wasn't the case with us. You know, I wanted to figure out what Vitriol Sound was. And that was that was such a hard-earned time-earned process uh with the second album like with the first album you're trying to create something from nothing and with the second album you're trying to catch lightning in a bottle you know like you're trying to not necessarily do it again but you're the anxiety of i mean they call it the sophomore curse for a reason like there's a term for that you know where it's you look down, right? I think I see this a lot. What I mean, what do I mean by that? Uh, I see see this happen with artists a lot where they make something completely in their element for them, you know, and it pops off because little did they know when they were making it that the best thing you can do for your audience is do what's true to you, do what you really like. So it's not hard to do that with the first album for anybody because they don't have a fan base to lose. You know what I mean? They're not pandering to anybody. They have no expectations to meet. The only expectations they're meeting is in the purity of their garage or their basement with their friends who like the same shit that they do. And they made something that they believed in. They put that album out. All of a sudden people care. Now the pressure is on and they start making it for everyone but themselves. And that's when their music sucks. And it takes a tremendous amount of restraint and indignation and like it, it 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 takes a lot to keep making stuff for yourself as your band grows because the more your band grows the more people rely on you to um not even not just people on your team but your fans too depend on you to output a certain kind of quality uh and it, it almost feels radically selfish to say none of that matters to me but i have it has to you have to have that attitude like in order to make good art you have to have that attitude like none of that can matter you have to be willing to make an album that nobody likes uh and that's scary and especially when you work really hard with your band for 10 years you get success with the first full length and then you're like fuck this could all go away if I don't nail this. How do I nail this again? It's a really long answer to your question. I'm sorry. But well, I'd say the book. It's a great. It's, 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 I'm enjoying listening to you because especially after listening to the record, obviously, I, I, I enjoy picking your brain because from a listening standpoint, when I listen to an album, I analyze it from my with my own personal baggage, with my own personal experiences. And I always want to feel like or at least try to get an understanding of what did the artists feel when they made the record not because it's going to change how i feel towards the record but just because i want to see what other layers this album have that okay i caught this layer but what what did the artists have in mind what did what will the next person have in mind when they listen to the record i think that's the beauty of music is that you could have one album that means 10 different things to 10 different people yeah, it's amazing. I love that. And I get asked that. They're like, does it bother you when people don't, when you have fans that like don't really get like the depth of them? And I'm like, no, that doesn't bother me. Like if a fan, if I have a fan that's just like, man, I love your blast beats. Fucking A, dude. That's awesome. You know, like I don't. So it's, yeah, the, the idea that uh, artistic interpretations can be so different. And then, you know, even fans that just want to bang their head and it's crazy yeah, that how radically different our relationships with music can be and, and what we get from it. Uh, that's what's been one of the more interesting things about getting out there and meeting more people as I tour and, and talk, do interviews and stuff like that. It's just what what this music means to everybody. And there's certain common threads that like everyone shares, but it's it's really diverse. It's really interesting.
I, I thought you were going to say, I don't care what people think about the music as long as they like it and they buy merch. I, I thought that's where you were going to go. <laughs> no. As, no. As, they, as long as they fall under those two categories, they can they can interpret it any way they want. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I'm bringing so if they're, you know, if it gets your, if my, at the end of the day, if my music gets your blood pumping, gives you a little bit of extra, you know, healthy anger and and you know i'm stoked i'm stoked you know that's as long as we, we if i'm reaching you in some way I, i'm stoked i discover you guys uh not through the debut album i discover you guys through watching guys play live you guys have played in toronto you guys have been on a bunch of tours that have come to, through toronto and that's how i discovered the band even before i picked up the record to listen to uh considering how much you guys have toured on, on that debut album you guys are road dogs as far as touring is concerned how how much of that impacts the way you approach the 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 song making process on this album other oh, awesome man you have great questions I'm not just saying that i don't just say that to people um yeah uh it <laughs> that's tough because it was I'll say this. It is very, 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 very difficult to perform the vocals and the guitar parts at the same time for that, for the material on the first record. Well, for any of our material going and set and after going out and doing the road dog thing for years on that first album, that was a really humbling experience. Uh, and going into this next album, I had to like have a little conversation with myself. And I'm like, Kyle, you cannot short change these riffs because you want to make it easier on yourself like you can't do that but there are parts where i felt like if i can be like i kind of piggybacking on my previous answer about making the album more dynamic i did feel as though there are parts in the songs that my vocal performance could be more i could have more emotion or conviction if if the part that i'm playing is what am i trying to say played not necessarily simpler but played in a certain way that allows for that kind of there are parts in the first album where i feel like the vocal section and the the instrumental section kind of fight against each other in a way that's not difficult that's in like a rewarding way yeah i, I don't I, yeah, I think it could be done more responsibly. And so I tried to do that with this album was be more conscientious about not only the musical interplay between the vocals and the the instruments, but the 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 mechanical interplay between the vocals and the instruments. So uh, I also uh, you'll for anyone that listens to these albums back to back, our first one, and our, our new one, you'll notice that the Adam and I, the two vocalists, we're we're ping ponging much more rapidly on this new album. Whereas on the the previous album, it was more like I took a verse, he took a verse, I took a chorus, he took it, that kind of a thing. This one, we're more da 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 da, and that not only for me, I thought sounded more interesting, but it it's going to make it easier on us live because rather than sitting there and and doing sentence after sentence after sentence were, you know, bah, 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 jam and jam and jam and jam and jam and bah, 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 bah. you know what I mean? And that's, I think that's going to be more effective in a live setting. What, what aspect, because we talked about, uh, you know, you said you used the word dense. I, I already recorded my review of the album. I used that word as well, but I, I felt like this album for as dense as it is, it doesn't lose its shape. And what I mean by that is that you could still hear all of the different elements in it in their own space. And then obviously all of them together is what creates the density. A lot of bands these days, when they're putting an album that is dense, you lose the shape of the sound and you lose the shape of the record and everything just becomes this big mush. Not the case on this record. Uh, how difficult it is to achieve that? Because to me, it has a great end result, but it doesn't sound like it's an easy path to get there. Definitely, man. Thank you. Uh, th thanks. Uh, yeah, I think a part of it is the direction in which it's cr created. I think when people are trying to trying to make something dense, when they let that be their guiding value, 
let's just make something dense. They, how do I put it? They're often thinking about, in my experience, they're often thinking about the end result. You know, the, this just, this brick of sound and they'll just kind of get there. When you, God, what am I trying to say? When you, when you're trying to race to an end result, you'll usually use non-musical ways to get there. Um, with vitriol, the density is more of a consequence of the process rather than the ultimate goal. I like that our music is dense, but I'm not, I've never once ever started a vitriol, writing vitriol song by saying to myself, I want the song to be like, I want the song to have 12,000 parts and be super dense. It's just what I, I tried to make what moved me the most and that's what ended up happening. And it's kind of a, kind of a consequence of me um, having a bit of a creative blind spot and that I actually have a really hard time looking seeing the big picture like i can't hear a song in its entirety like some musicians can do that some musicians like hear a song they hear the drum part they hear the guitar they they hear the accompaniments i can't do that my brain doesn't work that way i'm just one foot in front of the other and i have a relentlessness to my approach in the creative process i'm just willing to spend more time on things than most other people are so it's just it's it's just an end result of that this perfectionist this tedious little tinkering every little tiny part before i even move on to the next part and then it's just layer on top of layer on top of layer on top of layer you know it's like the difference between building a cathedral or a barn you know what i mean like our stuff is very and that's like barns are great I love lots of barns, you know, like it's not <laughs> shitting on that, you know, it's just, it's just a different thing. You know, they do different, they're, they're so for me, because I have such a rev, rev, reverent relationship with metal music. Uh, it's basically like gospel music to me. It's, it's really, it's, it's, it's more than music to me that I really like to bring that devotional approach to my music and say, like, I'm going to give this thing everything I have. And it's not, it won't be done until there's nothing left in me. And that's just usually what happens on the other end. I just don't have more is more, baby. I just have that attitude, you know. More is more. You don't hear that every day. More is more. Uh yeah. one of the things I, I noticed on this album, perhaps more than the debut record, maybe maybe it was there in the debut record, but I felt on this album was maybe a little bit better defined. And that is some atmospheric elements that are very subtle like it's not like you're trying to be a band like you know draconian or 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 you know those kind of bands that are super atmospheric but you you infused enough that every so often it kind of peaks up and it, what it does it for me at least as a listener what it did was it took a little bit away from that density and gave me specific pockets where it allowed me to better digest the music w was that your goal you're this is you're my favorite Pedro. <laughs> hey, yeah. Uh, we, we, I, I'm going to put that to the test the next time you guys come to Toronto. I'm going to come and say hi to you. Please, please. That'd be great. Um, and it is Pedro, right? Uh, I yeah. think I read. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, it is. You know, it is. It was that. And I'm so glad because I think that stuff could be seen as just adding more to this d density. But for me, it had that exact, it was it, it was exactly that. It was like taking, I used the metaphor earlier about highlighting and underscoring. And I felt like that's what that was doing was because vitriol is so relentless in, in you know, we blast a lot. And that's always going to be the case. And because of that, and because I'm so dedicated to a musical experience, which relentless blasting can sometimes take away from, you have to create dynamic elsewhere. This is why I'm so passionate about having two snares. I make all of our drummers use two snares, much to their some of their chagrin, because for me, if you're blasting 70% of the time, 
why do you not have access to more than one fucking tone? You have three toms that you barely use, but you have one snare that you're using 70% of the time. Like you can use a second pitch snare to create more dynamic without having to slow down. And for me, the post-production elements was like the next step in that direction was being able to create more dynamic, more clear transitions, kind of like what you said you were picking up on is it, it, it helped kind of like uh goal posts, you know, like little milestone markers. Exactly. They kind of let you know, oh, I'm here again, you know, and or oh, we're in a different, you know, it, I think those elements can transport you and really highlight not only the musical shifts, but the emotional shifts. Um and this album in spirit is more there's always been a, a, a strong black metal influence in our music. Um, whether it be philosophically or musically, uh, this new album went further in that direction. So I wanted uh, to kind of pay homage to that by going heavier into the post-production elements as well, without it becoming like a, you know, like generic. Yeah, 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 exactly. Well, you, you mentioned uh, about yourself when you're playing live, the vocals, the guitars, it, it's hard to, to, to manage both things. When you look at yourself in the mirror, do you see yourself more of a vocalist or do you see yourself more of a guitar player? Guitar player, for sure. Um, I absolutely a guitar player. Um, that's my craft. That's the love affair. That's the medium. Like that's the, the vocals are really, the truth of the matter is, I probably wouldn't do vocals for my band if it wasn't super important to me that I do the lyrics, but I knew I wanted to write the lyrics. Um, I knew I had something to say and it was part pra partly out of practicality, which sounds funny. Like, why is it practical to do this? But um, it's really hard to find band members that, especially if you're really driven and you really want to do something, it's hard to find people that, that want that as well. Um, and also it's hard to find a vocalist that will, that is, that is willing to do someone else's, to present someone else's message. And also it felt a little dishonest to me to have someone else trying to express conviction behind my words. Um, so I think of myself more as like almost a singer songwriter. It sounds kind of dorky, but I think of myself as like a death metal singer songwriter. Like the same if I had like an acoustic guitar and I was writing my own little folk songs about my life. Like that's that's how I see myself. Um, You're the death metal Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say I, you know, but yeah, I I I like to approach my work in a similar way. Yeah, where they kind of they're hard to take apart, but at the end of the day, uh, if I had to say I'm a vocalist or a guitar player, I'd be a, a guitar player. My favorite song on the record is "The Isolating Lie of Learning Another." I love that song. I'm not going to ask you if I'm going to hear it live. I, I I'd rather be surprised with the future set list when you guys come to Toronto. But do you have a song on the record that the moment you finish the track, you're like, "This is going to be on the set list" because I can now wait to rip this one up. Yeah, uh, honestly, that's one of them. I, I don't want to, you know, I don't, we don't have any set, li set lists set up yet. But that intro riff on isolating. Oh, oh, dude, dude, it's, it's killer. killer. I love it. And it's so unusual. I, I slightly but... jizz myself every time I hear that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's that kind of seasick, like. Oh, just like and like it's it's you know what I call it? I tell my son all the time, it's one of those riffs that makes you want to suck your own dick. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the kind oh of my thing God. you get out of that kind of riff. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious, man. That's the best thing I've heard in an interview yet. Uh thank you. Yeah, it's a huge compliment. <laughs> Yeah, but I've been. The <laughs> you know, I'm really eager to play that live. I think it's just such a bone crushing riff. It is just like the moment for me that like vitriol like takes our fucking you know takes our shoes off and we're just like fucking like no let's turn our brains off and just like fucking smash you know. Um, I love that riff. 
Uh, I also, uh, the outro to the flowers of sadism is really heavy for me. Uh, I think it's one of the heaviest moments on the album. I'm really excited to play that live. And I think I'm giving you like three answers to the, your question, but the, 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 the outro section of shame and it's afterbirth, the big, like insane lead layered lead with all the voices and the fucking like i think that's going to be really overwhelming live and i'm really excited to to overstimulate the crowd with that section i got one last question for you uh and that is that you guys are from portland there's a vibrant music scene in port like there's incredible bands from all different genres coming out of Portland. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just it's just crazy. It's like every time a new band releases a record, you find out they're from Portland. Oh, what's going on there? Is there something in the water? Are you guys cultivating something that only you guys have access to? What's what's happening in Portland? I think it's, uh, yeah. I mean, I think it's a perfect storm. You know, we have, we're a good city for art in general. Uh, anything that's creative, uh, it's a hotbed for that. Um, so it's just such a, what I notice, especially touring is that there's much more mm -hmm. there's so many subcultures packed inside of a tight space in Portland and that, that presents some tension, but it also presents an opportunity to like, you can't help, but let that stuff kind of bleep seep into your, your, your brain, either consciously or subconsciously. So I think that is, creates a really strong environment, a uh, healthy environment for fresh, innovative kind of genre warping uh, sounds. I also think our, us being in such such close Jesus Christ such close proximity to nature plays a big role in it you know like when you think of all of these other big uh metropolitan urbanized highly socialized cities like you know New York Brooklyn uh LA there's very 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 urban they're very concrete and to me, that's really bad for creativity. Um, and it's really bad for like metal. You know, I think I, the fact that we're closer to like the source out here, I think it plays a big role in it. You know, we're, we got, that's to me, that's the most special thing about Portland is it has all the amenities, the accessibility, the cultural fruit of a big, big metropolitan city but with all of the you know with this warm ring of nature around it that you can literally drive five minutes and be maybe not five but you can drive 10 15 minutes and be in the middle of the fucking woods you can be at the beach you could be you know at the coast you could be in the desert you could be in the mountains so for me i know i know my band would sound very different if i didn't have that experience that kind of contrast between those two things is. Well, whatever it is, man, it's working because the bands keep popping and the music is great. So uh, I'm, I'm all for it. Well, Kyle, man, thank you very much for your time today. This was an absolute blast. Uh, the next time you guys play in Toronto, I'll come and say hi and maybe we'll have a chat because I still, I honestly, I still have a bunch of other things I wanted to ask you about, but I, I want you guys to experience the album release play some shows, get a feel for what people are saying and, and, and how they're vibing with the new material. So we'll have a chat next time you come to Toronto. That sounds great, man. Thanks for your time and your patience. I know I can be, I apologize for the long answers. I oh, can, I, love my brain works. I talk I love like my album sound. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's perfect because from my standpoint, that's what I want. I, I like, now going back and listening to the record, the record is going to sound maybe not different, but I'm going to appreciate different things about it that I didn't catch before. And and I, I like to compare notes, if you will, my notes as a listener to your notes as the creator. And I think uh, these kind of chats are really good for those listening to it so that they can have that same sort of experience of being able to compare notes from what they got from the record versus what you had in mind when you created the record. 
Absolutely. I think that that's a, that's a great thing to offer. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, man. All the best. And I'll see you on the road. All right. See you out there. Have a good one.